Right. Um, oh, goodness, this has come up to be the biggest room I've ever talked to. Um, by a factor of three, probably. Um, so I want to talk about password cracking today. Not probably the minutiae of the thing, but maybe some of the logistical issues. Um, the motivation, essentially, I got bored of remembering all the hash count options, running it over and over again. So we look for some efficiency savings. Um, there we go. So first off, this is the work I've done here, all built on top of Hashcat, John the Ripper, um, in packet, various word lists from a lot of people like tech lists, crackstation, hashes.org. Um, it uses graphing libraries of other people. Um, obviously, I'm only here because of B-sides in the first place, and the data set we're using is sort of a, a proving ground for all this stuff is from Troy Hunt. So um, there's a whole lot of people to, to thank for the work that's gone into here. Um, so I'm from NCC. This isn't particularly official NCC work. It's not also not that controversial, and they probably don't disagree with it. I don't think they've actually read it. So there is an NCC logo there, but please don't take this as official NCC stuff. Um, so the only interesting bits about me, I've built, improved, and managed multi-user password cracking systems at two UK pen test companies. Um, on and off, I've been cracking people's passwords since about 2003, uh, which was blue team stuff. Um, and yeah, there's, there's obviously more, but you don't need to know about it. Um, so wh why are we actually bothering this anyway? Um, some people tell you it's a solved problem, or it's a dull, boring problem. Um, unfortunately, it's a problem that comes up quite a lot in pen testing. So if we look at the, the naive approach, a lot of people just find a, a favorite word list, a favorite rule file, and then you know, just run that, um, which isn't actually too bad. Rock, rock you and then save you to dive is pretty good. Um, but we can certainly do better. Um, so in terms of other things we do need to do, the sort of, as a pen tester, you'll come across maybe 40 or so common hash formats. Um, so it's not all just NTLM. There's plenty of other things out there like Kerberos, various things, and so on. Uh, we also need to do format conversions in quite a few places. Um, and obviously, when you're in pen test, you've got a hard time limit. You want to get everything as soon as you possibly can. Um, another approach I've heard from people is just to use a massive 80 gig word list, which is fine if it's in frequency order. Um, if it's not, then you're sort of wasting your own time, and it's better to use a targeted one. So from both the red and blue team point of view, I want to talk about bad and good hashes, why they're bad and why they're good. Um, I'll then go on to the hash crack, crack script I've written, which is essentially just a big glue script. Um, offensive uses of password cracking and then defensive uses. And then, say, as a test bed, we'll just talk about the Troy Hunt data set. Um, and obviously last week I realized that I promised to do a CTF as well, which is not really a CTF in that sense, but it's a challenge that people can do at home. Um, so that'll be the last bit. So MD5, why is it a bad hash for us? We don't care about the various cryptographic flaws at this point, the pre-image stuff. Um, the only issue for us is it's very, very quick to compute. So uh, I think I've been separating my 1080 Ti. Uh, that guesses 35 billion tries against MD5 in a second, um, which is just not acceptable. I've, I've written that there's no salt, so you could compute lookup table of common you know, questions and answers. Um, but in practice, no lookup table will beat 35 billion guesses a second anyway. How about this, there, that theoretical flaw? NTLM is based on MD4, and LM is even worse than those two. So that's an example of a whole lot of bad hashes. And unfortunately for most of us, we can't really get rid of NTLM for our environments. They are going to be stored there somewhere. 
um, other examples of bad hashes. People have tried doing various homebrew crypto schemes to shore up their MD5 hashes. Um, so adding secret data in, which is um, it's a reasonably well codified approach. You just have to make sure that the secret stays secret. Um, so you may find yourself attacking this, like I found one web app where essentially a, a random string, fixed string was appended to the thing, um, which means you can just write one John the Ripper rule and it will crack it for you. So please just use a good library function. Um, Blowfish or Argon2 are good examples, or PBKDF2 if you haven't got either of the others. Um, PHP 7 implements it even so you can generate a nice strong hash that essentially it needs to be just a bit quicker than annoying for the user to compute it once. Um, so maybe one tenth of a second, and then this will really cause the attacker problems. Um, because there's a random sort involved in the process, which is stored along with it, it becomes infeasible to create a lookup table of you know all the common questions and answers you've got. So at some point I got bored of typing out commands by hand over and over and over. Um, so I built the script which essentially tries to guess the, guess the hash type for you, so you don't need to remember what $2a means or anything like that. Um, if it's a more complex thing like a, uh, a zip file, it will try to decode via the John the Ripper script, which will come out with your hash or the hash that you need to attack. Um, and it'll also, based on what it thinks the speed of the hash is, it'll try some dictionaries and rules. Um, and also the, the mapping of regular expressions to hash types and hash types to what parameters to run it with um, is stored as data files. So it's fairly easy to tweak if I mean, you're very unlikely to have the same exact same cards that I've got. Um, and that's currently AGPL on GitHub. So, sorry. Um, the, the motivation behind writing this script was uh, I was bored of writing the same commands over and over again. Um, so I wanted to create a system which would essentially take all the thinking out of the initial attacking of these hashes. So I don't have to remember how to unpack some file format. I don't have to remember roughly how fast it is. Um, I can just essentially feed it to this and see how it gets on to start with, and then maybe tweak it from there. Um, another important thing to do is to actually have a codified technique so I can see if it's good or not, and then we can think about improving it. Um, so the graph on the right is, is not using this system, it's using it's from our work system. However, it does show a steady improvement in the ratio of password to cracking, which is obviously what we want to see. It's great me writing a script, but if it's not, you know, if the output's rubbish, then, you know, it's no use to anyone. Um, so the other reason I wrote this is because I'm often stuck in machine rooms, so I don't have access to our cracking cluster, so I have to do it on my laptop. Uh, and also being in machine rooms a lot enabled me to have some free time to write this when I'm right, waiting for my Nessus scans to finish. So the, um, the way Hashcrack works is it has five main attack modes. Um, you have a hybrid sort of dictionary rules approach. Um, there's a mode A1, which is the cross product. I tries every word of list A with every word of list B. Um, and you've got various mask modes. <coughs> So above all with this, we want to keep the GPU busy. If you just feed it a, if you've got NTLM hashes, you just feed it a standard dictionary, it won't really utilize the whole GPU. So you need to give it more things to try, either with um, dictionary and mask or dictionary and rules. Um, we also want it to start finding passwords you know, quickly. They need to be at the front 
So for something like NTLM, it'll run really quickly with the incremental mode A3, which basically tries all possible combinations of masks up to whatever you want. So we want to find passwords quickly rather than at the end of the process. Um, the other thing which is more of a design consideration then than it is now maybe was to reuse, obviously if you crack any LM hashes that are present, you know the corresponding NTLM is going to be that same word with a different capitalization. Um, I thought LM was dead, but in April I found another domain with LM on it, so that functionality is not quite obsolete yet. So I think it supports maybe 30, 40 hash types, but we'll take pwdump files that we all know and love as an as example. Um, if you feed it pwdump file, it will uh, first try the LM hashes. They're probably all blank these days. Um, if there are any, then we use that as a crib uh, using a rule which essentially gives you all the case permutations of that word. Um, it'll then try the incremental mask mode up to eight characters, which I think allows upper, lower, digit to start, then lower and digit, and then special on the end, maybe. Um, it will also run a few other modes, and then it will fall back to the basic bog standard, whatever dictionary you think we can get away within a few hours together with some rules. So that seemed like a reasonable approach for NTLM. Then you come across something like bcrypt, which is um, basically the exact, exact opposite. So it's salted, which means that the runtime scales with the number of hashes. NTLM, you can crack 50, 500, 5 million, and it won't make much difference to the runtime. bcrypt, two hashes takes twice as long as one hash. So um, you can only really afford some fairly small dictionary files. In this case, you don't need any rules or any masks to keep up speed in general, so you can just feed it with your sort of top 95k file or something like that. Um, so that's essentially what the script does. It stops me from having to think about all these issues every time, um, and it tells you what it's doing if you need to tweak it for your own purposes. Um, so during a red team engagement, we get hashes from a number of places. If you can get away with running Responder or dumping NTDS util stuff directly, um, you can get those. You've got Kerberos, you've got internal monologue, um, nicking devices, SMB, URI leaks, office docs, zip files, all these things. Um, at least either ha R hashes or imply hashes in the case of office docs. And um, during a red team, obviously, you never know what's going to be useful, so you may as well just start cracking things as soon as you've got them. Um, so the nice thing about password cracking is once you've abstracted, extracted that hash, um, the target doesn't know you're cracking it. Obviously, you can replace some hashes, but uh, it's always nice to have a password, if only because then you can retry that password on other things. Um, so uh, it's just nice to have something kicked off in the background where you can then go and think about other things that you need to do. Um, for the blue team, I would say don't share passwords across security domains. Um, for example, I saw a printer and a router sharing the same SNMP password. And obviously, printers are not hardened in the same way routers are. Um, and it would very easily give it up. Um, as a red team, that's exactly what you're trying to exploit. So you can see that reasonably well. The, this is sort of relative hash speeds. So the two on the left, are LM and NTLM, those are both unsalted, so they're actually worse than that looks. Um, sorry, it's a log graph. Otherwise, it would be, um, you wouldn't be able to read it properly. So NTLM is very fast and unsalted. LM, do we all know? So LM is broken into two halves, which makes it, worse, and it's capitalized, which makes it worse still. So it's really a terrible hashing scheme. Um, from there, you have sort of uh, domain cache credentials, NetLM v1, and so on. 
Um, so the point is obviously the first batch of those up to DCC2 are much more likely to all have this, you know, whatever hash you get is going to represent a Windows domain password. So it's in your interest to be cracking NTLM rather than DCC2. Um, I've put Office 2007 and 2013 on for comparison as well. Um, but say, obviously, it's better for you to be attacking the faster hashes. Um, so things that I've written this to support and that I've used personally, um, you can just feed it a, a, something you've gathered through NTGSC tool and an IFM. So that standard thing. If you've installed it properly, it will run in packet secret stump to unpack it for you, and then it'll do its work. Same with responder.db. Runs a SQL like query to get the NTLM hashes out. Um, salaries.xls, x, it will run the script from John the Ripper, which will again give you a hash that Hashcap can work with. So this is uh, not really original work, just a sort of glue script. Um, so, because I got bored of typing out these things. <coughs> um, so that's a, a slightly trimmed down example of running it against a docx file from the test suite. Uh, so you can see it's run Python 2, officerjohn.py. It's got the hash out. As you can see at the bottom, it runs hash cat using the appropriate mode. Picks a reasonably here because it's a test suite. I, I've put the answer straight in in the form of hashcat.txt. Um, in real life, obviously, you have to wait for it a bit. So essentially, it's just meant to take time and uh, it needs to take the essentially take the hard thinking work out of doing this stuff um, for sort of the blue team people you can also do this um, and this is what I was doing in 2003 2004 if you crack your own domain hashes you can see essentially what the really weak ones are so it's unlikely that anyone would be able to uh, obtain your NTLM hashes directly, but if people have got passwords like, you know, password one, welcome one, two, three, that's probably guessable within the parameters of your account lockout policy. Um, so it's very much worth doing this. Just because you crack something in this offline attack doesn't necessarily mean it's an awful password, um, but you may want to look at the data as a whole and considering, consider sort of updating your password policies. Um, unfortunately, the default Windows password policy isn't very flexible. Um, so a lot of people are trying to add a filter to stop you know, things like welcome, welcome one bang, which technically complies with policy, but still isn't a good password. Um, <laughs> So from the blue team point of view, you, you want to stop people choosing really weak passwords. Um, passwords that are widely compromised if they are tied to the same account, certainly. Um, and things based on dictionary words. Um, <clears throat> so the, the essential idea is that if you can stop people choosing a small group of very weak passwords, and you can have a decent account lockout or rate limiting policy of some kind, then you should basically be okay. And it'll you know, it'll greatly reduce the instance of people guessing correct credentials. Um, as I say, cracking your own passwords is a great way to find the really low hanging fruit here. Um, so I graphed lengths of the, um, the 500 million passage you got from Troy Hunt. Um, you could see Shannon entropy isn't, isn't a wonderful way of estimating how good a password is, but on the other hand, it's relatively easy to compute. Um, you can see there's a, a fairly good sort of dome-shaped graph, modulo some quantization, um, whereas the password length tends to have a bit of a longer tail on the right, which is just people who use longer passwords using less complex passwords, but that's fine. That's why longer passwords exist. Um, so, for example, if you want to stop people choosing uh, passwords that have been in Troyhunt's breach itself, you can send them the, I think that's the SHA-1 hash, and it'll literally tell you whether it's been compromised or not. Um, for those worried about privacy, 
there is a more anonymous way of querying that apparently, which I have not needed to look into yet. Again, for the blue team, when you're cracking these, um, if you get Hashcat and use the status output, say every 10 seconds or so, you can actually see where the, so the x axis is time uh, and the y axis is how many passwords are recovered. So you can see whether essentially your, all your passwords are to the left of that graph, which means they're generally weak, or if they're sort of centered to the right, which means essentially that the uh, they're not very easily guessable, they are guessable, but at least you've made the attacker work for it. Um, so for anyone who wants to get into this, depending on budget, um, you can start with an entry level that laptops do fine, CPUs still do fine for a lot of things. Um, if you are using a laptop, be very careful about overheating it. So make sure it's got enough airflow and please do not disable the hardware monitoring. Um, at home I've got a modest tower which is essentially a 1080 Ti with some scaffolding. Um, you can have a homebrew case of multi cards or anything like that. Um, you can buy one off the shelf for about 25,000 US dollars which is very nice. Um, you can use Hashtopolis to cluster very small units. Um, the only one I haven't played with really is AWS because the if, essentially if I forget to turn something off I'll suddenly get a bill of 20k at the end of the month and I'm not prepared for that so I'd, I'd rather spend a couple of k on hardware. So that's the tower. I've got a cooling pad for my laptop because it's slightly temperamental. Um, the cooling pad costs about a tenner on Amazon, so it's uh, not not particularly a stretch. And yeah, as I say, on on these two things, I got through those sort of five hundred million passwords in a couple of weeks. So it's a it illustrates this is in reach of everyone to try this stuff. Uh, and B NTLM is really not a good hash. So if you want to replicate this stuff, um, and I say I'm essentially just using this as a, as a validation for the approach I've taken. So you can download the passes from uh, Tryhunt's site, um, get them, unzip them. Uh, you need to, from this particular file, you need to take off the frequency data. Um, you will also need to put a small tweak into the code. So the bitmap max, max parameter is fine for basically every data set that I've looked at apart from this one. Um, it's to do with uh, sort of what's to do with, and it, you need to set it high enough. Cashcat 5 will warn you if it's too low and it'll basically say set it higher and just you keep setting it higher until it's okay and then it runs at a reasonable speed. Otherwise it will be very slow. Also, the whole data set doesn't fit in even 1080 Ti. So what I had to do was split it into chunks of 500, sorry, 50 million lines. Um, if you are going to do this, make sure you put L, which is 50 million lines, and not N, which is 50 million chunks. Even X4 doesn't like 50 million files. Uh, so I think I had about presumably 10, 11 files uh, which then got essentially run a particular approach against each chunk. Dash dash remove takes your answers out. So basically, your answers accumulate in try1.pot. Um, then you, at the end, you stitch the file back together, substantially smaller, and then repeat with the next phase. The other thing I found I needed to send the output to, once I was happy it was working, I needed to send the output to dev null because um, literally writing out the found passwords to the terminal was slowing things down. So we've got sort of um, dictionary and rules available to play with, <coughs> incremental attack with masks. Um, then you've got A6, A7, which is sort of wordless and mask. And then the sort of cross product of two dictionaries. Um, so I'll probably just explain 
the, the other ones are obvious, but the A1 and the masks. Um, A1 literally tries every word from the left dictionary next to every word from the right dictionary. So that bolded square is what you get. Um, for masks, the syntax is slightly complex, but basically, question mark U is any uppercase, question mark L is any lowercase, and it'll iterate through all the possible values of that. Uh, just skip over this briefly because it's not directly relevant. Um, as well as doing that, you can also feed stuff in standard if you need to, if you've run out of other ideas. Um, so in terms of my script, those same attacks are expressed like this. And then this is actually what I got out of the try hunt data. So the default run with, I think, top 258 million and some rules got literally 250 million. Um, then incremental attacks. There's a list called breach compilation online. Um, then a slightly more aggressive mask approach versus two, which had more, more special characters. Um, the top two Billy this was quite good. Um, the next one, 258 million and last four, I essentially computed the common suffixes and it's just taking a load of common words, whacking common suffixes on them um, and seeing what you get. And the answer is that's quite a good approach as well. Um, I also tried some other dictionaries with suffixes and then the best of all, probably because essentially hashes are always been attacking the same list um, and I am aware of that. Uh, hashes are all got another sort of 25 million. Um, and if you add those, all those up, that is over 500 million. So like I say, that's that's two weeks work on a um, 1080 Ti. You could probably do it in three weeks on a laptop these days. So is there any practical use to us other than validating the approach? Probably not directly. Um, so if you're going to use it as a dictionary, you should prune out the really obvious words because you'd probably want to be searching that in the other approach. So there we go. Um, it needs more work, as does everything. Um, only so far, John the Ripper supports BitLocker OpenCL, for example. That's not in Hashcat yet. Um, so this will be up again. I did promise the CTF I saw last week in my submission, so there is one. If you want to have a go, there's various, I think, five or six formats. Um, crack as many as you can, starting with the easiest, and um, send them to me, and I will do something for the winner. It would be nice to see the solution on your blog, if you like, um, but I'll just take answers. So on the web... Right, I'll skip through those. On that website, there is a bunch of references there because they got too big anyway. So I'll just go to questions with... Uh, that up on it there. Two questions, I think. Sorry. Yep. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you do the automatic identification of hashes. Um, my experience that the takeaways that also automatic. So yeah. what was your experience with that? Yeah, some of them sorry, the question was how well does regular expression work for matching on hash types? The answer is anywhere between very well and and not at all. So NTLM and MD5 look exactly the same. There is no way to tell them apart. Um, whereas obviously things like $1, $2, $5, very easy. So um, the regular expressions I've got have been arrived at empirically. So yes, they, they work well enough for me. So is there a specific way of um, selecting a cash type with your screen? Uh, no, you can just tell it what it is if you if you know better. Thank you. Uh, we're actually out of time. Sorry. Thank you very much.